so good uh, to be here today and to be back in the pulpit. I want to share with you something that I think you're going to find interesting. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to read uh, just verses 1 through 3, but in three different translations. Three different translations. Now, I am an 80s baby. That's right. And I remember playing video games. Uh, actually, it was our generation who kind of brought those in, right? And I remember always looking for a cheat code. Looking for a cheat code. As a matter of fact, that's the title. Uh, it's not working, Rudy. I don't know what to tell you. So uh, I was always looking for a cheat code, right? In Hebrews chapter 12, I feel like I found a cheat code for life. But I just want to tell you something, just something maybe you didn't know, right? So uh, I looked up the history of cheat codes. And I'm going to give you a little fact. You may not care, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. But I found that the video game that had the most cheat codes, quick disclaimer, I've never played this video game. I've never let my kids play this video game. Okay, I've just thrown that out there before you all judge me. I can already see the judgment here. But apparently no game in the entire game legacy has more cheat codes than Grand Theft Auto. By the looks of your faces and the laughs, some of you have been playing Grand Theft Auto, but I'm not here to judge you. That's why you're in the house of the Lord. Okay. <laughs> so apparently there's like thousands of cheat codes. Now, I don't know anything about that. Okay, but however... There is a historical cheat code that is known by more individuals around the world than anything else. And I'm going to start it and you're going to finish it for all you old gamers out there. That's what's up, okay? I'm talking Nintendo gamers. Come on, somebody. Okay, you ready? Up, up. Keep going. Left, right. B-A, B-A, start. That's what I'm talking about, yes. Did you know... I didn't know this, but that cheat code is good for over 200 games. Woo, that's good information right there. Because you know what? I'm not losing to no seven-year-old kid ever again in my life. I'm going to use the cheat code. So I want to talk to you about the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And we're going to read from the NIV, the passage translation. And then we're going to read from the Amplified. And I'm going to outline for you what I believe is a cheat code for life, okay? And so let's go to the NIV version. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's jump on over to the passage translation. It says this, as for us, we all have these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. By the way, um, when I looked this up and I did a little comparison between the Greek and the English translations, right, I really feel like this passage right here, this little portion that says there's a great cloud encircling us is the best dynamic equivalent we can get. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll tie that all together here in a minute, okay, just, just give me some time, but this is so accurate. It says this, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin that so easily, the, so, the sin that we so easily fall into. Then we'll be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. For the path has been already marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm and we focus our attention and our expectations onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. He endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation. And now he sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So beautiful. Amplified version, verses 12, 1 through 3. Or chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, stripping off every unnecessary weight and this sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us. Let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set out before us. Looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, the first incentive of our belief and the one who, the cross, disregarding the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to read your word. I thank you, Lord, that it's alive and active. 
It's ready to do its work today. Father, it is my prayer that as you speak to me, speak through me for the blessing and the benefit of your people. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. So I want to talk to you because I literally believe, and we're going to go literally verse by verse here. I believe there's a cheat code. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like life is getting the best of me. And when I came across this, and by the way, this is one of my most favorite chapters, spe- specifically these three verses. is like, this is a, if, you know, I, I love it so much I could put this as a tattoo somewhere. I don't know, but I could put it somewhere, right? I love it that much. But I want to show you something that I found to be so instrumental in, in my life. First off, he says, get rid of the thing that pierces you. Get rid of the arrow's tip. If you literally look it in the Aramaic, it literally means get rid of the arrow's tip. You know how we have sayings, uh, that person's a snake in the grass, or that person speaks with a forked tongue, or you know what I'm saying, you can't trust them. They're idioms, right? They're sayings. This right here, when it talks about getting rid of the sin, it literally it was a saying to get rid of the arrow's tip. If you've ever seen uh, movies where they use bow and arrows and someone gets shot, what do they do? They, they, they break it off, right? They break that arrow off. But then later on in the movie, you'll watch them and they're trying to get um, they're trying to get that arrow's tip out of them, right? Like, okay, now we got to pull it out, and then we got to get that hot metal, and we got to sear it, and the guy's always taking a drink and pouring a drink. And how many know what I'm talking about, right? Now, I did a little research. I did a little research because it says, so we must let go of every wound that pierces us. Every wound that pierces us. And they literally said that's an, a reference to an arrow's tip. And I did a little research, and the reason they got to get the arrow's tip out of it is because if you leave it in, it's a cesspool for bacteria, and the next thing you know is you get an infection, and you don't die from the arrow's tip, you die from the infection. Okay, now, we got to go somewhere, and you may not like this, but we got to go somewhere. This is the equivalence of you've got to work on your issues. You've got an arrow's tip in you, and it is starting to poison the rest of your body. That arrow's tip can be unforgiveness. You're holding on to something that that you should have pulled out a long time ago and allowed the Holy Spirit to heal. And now it's been an infection. Now it's created a bitter root. Can I I help you real quick? You know how you know you have a bitter root? I'm I'm, going to show you how. Because all of a sudden, somebody will start talking about somebody. And the first thing that comes up out of your mouth is something very negative, and you're almost surprised by it. Like, where'd that come from? Well, it came from you. Right? I remember being in marriage counseling one time, and I'm not saying if it was him or her or it. I'm not saying anything, right? I'm just saying what was happening. And all of a sudden, it got, it got real nasty real quick. And this person looked so shocked when they said something. And everybody in the room was like, ooh. I, I love the face they made. They're like, I don't know where that came from. And I'm like, You came from right down in here. <laughs> You're the guilty person, right? And, and, and what does that mean? That's because it had been festering so long. The Bible says out of the abundance of the, the heart, the mouth speaks. It had been festering so long, it finally bubbled up and came out. And so you might have an arrow tip of unforgiveness that has now been a bitter root. Or you might have the arrow's tip of a judgmental attitude. That anytime somebody talks about somebody, you, you have a comment about everybody, right? Or you might, have a, you might have an arrow's tip of a critical spirit. You're the only person who can do anything right. How many know that's you when you drive, though? Come on, somebody. That's you when you drive? Huh? Nobody else knows how to drive, huh? Okay, good. Only like seven of us are raising our hands, so that's bad. Okay, it's the rest of you that are driving bad. Then Okay, here we go. You might have an arrow's tip of a fence. I watch people carry a fence for years. You know, you've been in six other churches, but you're still talking about that first church. Like, how many churches are you going to go to before you deal with it? Can I give you a little secret? Everywhere you go, there you are. Kim, can you come sing or something? Kim, paging Kim. <laughs> okay, okay, how about this? You might have an arrow's tip of laziness. You're just unmotivated. You're unmotivated in your marriage. You're unmotivated in your spiritual walk. You're unmotivated when it comes to your kids. You're unmotivated for your job. God, don't do lazy. You, somebody should have said amen, but it's okay. I know you're sitting next to him. Don't worry about it. You, <laughs> parents, that was your point, though, to look at your kids and go, that's the Lord. The Lord. Okay. You might have an arrow's tip of pride. Pride. Right? 
And, and, and here's the truth. Your stubbornness is another form of pride. We don't like that either. I'm, I'm trying to do something we all like here. I just, and so we realize that, that, that your stubbornness is another form of pride. You're not moving because you think you know what to do. And God wants you to move, right? So he says this, and, and, and I'm going to build on this methodically. Now watch this, okay? So he says, get rid, of, get rid of these things, right? You need to deal with the stuff that has pierced your soul. And this is God's way of saying you're going to have to work on some things. You're going to have to work on it. This, this faith walk ain't no cakewalk. There's some things you need to do. Then he goes on to say this, and be careful of the sins that we fall into. Right? And the actual verse says, and the sin we're so easily ensnared or the sin we so easily fall into. Now, now, real quickly, think about this. He literally says a sin you fall into. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I like to think I'm a little bit better than that. Hello? I'm a little bit better. Like, like can, what this is implying is that there's some premeditative thought behind this. Like, you're going into this knowing that there's this trap, right? And, and, like, you're okay with it. You're not doing something about it. Can, can, I, can, can I put this to you in the, in the Anthony International version? Can I give it to you in my version? Can I, can I give it to you? It's going to come up on the board. Hit him with it, Rudy. Go ahead. Show him to him. Get rid of tomorrow's sins today. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? How many of you are visual learners? Wave at me if you're a visual learner. Visual learner, I got it for you. You're going to learn today. Are you ready? Are you ready? Get rid of tomorrow's sins today. Yes, that's how you do it. Get rid of tomorrow's sins today. There you go. See that? See that? See that? See that? See that? Okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to set somebody free right here, right now. Do yourself a favor and get off social media. That was a good word, wasn't it? Thank you. Like seven people gave me. That's a good word. The rest of you are guilty then. Somebody says, I just can't stop. I, I just got a comment. Turn it off and you ain't got to worry about the comment. Get rid of the app, and you don't got to worry about the comment. I'm going to set you free. Get rid of tomorrow's sins today. If old girl's number's still in there, get you a flip phone. Come on, somebody. Get rid of the phone. You know what we need to bring back for the youngsters? We need to bring back the dial phones, the rotary phones, right? Because if you mad at somebody, nine, seven, nine, son of a gun. <laughs> I messed up. <laughs> right? You need to get that old rotary phone to teach you patience. You'll think about before you call them, right? Get rid of your phone. If it's getting you into trouble, just get rid of it. Get you an old school flip phone. Nobody ever got in trouble with a flip phone. Come on. Too much work. You got to pull up the antenna. You got to flip it open. <laughs> How many know about the snake game, though? Come on, somebody. Snake game. Yeah. You youngsters are looking at me. They had a snake game? Shut up. You don't know nothing about it. All right, here we go. My point is get rid of tomorrow's sins today. I'm going to help you. Ready? Some of you may need to cancel Netflix. Some of you may need to get rid of Amazon. I like it. So somebody just looked up like. <laughs> got to get rid of Amazon? <laughs> yeah, you got to get rid of it. In other words, why do we keep falling into the same trap when we could just get rid of it today? I know, I know, I know a few weeks ago I said, some of you got friends. Um, they might be good to you, but they're no good for you. You know, you're a married man and all your boys are single. Give it some time. You're going to be single. Does this make sense? Are you a married woman and all your girlfriends, you got no relationships. Well, then you ain't going to have no relationships. Just give it a little minute. That's all. But we keep flirting with the sin, right? It's like, here's the line, oh, one foot here, one foot there, hey. Back two steps, come on, hey. No, that's not how it works. Get rid of tomorrow's sin today. This is what he's saying to us. The sin you fall into. Now watch this. He leads us right to here. And get ready for your faith. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon race. See, a lot of you always start out well. I'm going to do OSL. Two weeks in, I didn't make it to OSL. Right? I'm going to start growth track. It's the fourth time I've taken step one, but I'm going to complete it. Don't worry. Right? And we get this sprinter's mentality. But truly, the Bible says 
then we will be able to run life's marathon race. Has anybody here ever heard the story of how we got the marathon race? Because I'm going to give it to you. You're going to go to history class. You're going to learn today again. I'm going to introduce you to my friend. Now, when I Googled his name, uh, I, mean, I can't make this up. His name is Philadelphia Pez. Uh, I call him P. Diddy because I don't even know if the dude who taught me how to say it was right, but that, that's him. He's going to come up on the board. This is a statue. That was me when I was younger and leaner, but anyway, so that, that's P. Diddy right there. And this, is, this part is true. I don't know if how you say his name is correct, but it don't matter because anyway. Uh, so this is a true story. So he was in a battle. This was, it took place in Greece. And he was in a battle, and they had just won against an empire. And so he was really excited. They wanted to get the news back to everybody back home because morale was low. And everybody was going to kind of give up, and they didn't think they were going to win anyway. And it was a really bad time. So the story says that P. Diddy here, he literally said, hey, I'll go. I'll run the entire way. Now, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of, uh, of disagreement how long it was, okay, how long it was. But let's just say somewhere between 23 and 25 miles, okay. So he takes off running out. Here's what, his, here's what the history tells us, or legend, that when he began to run, he literally started to throw stuff off him. He had a spear. He threw down the spear. He had a shield. He threw off the shield. He had a sword. He got rid of the sword. He had a breastplate that would at least stop some arrows. He took it off, and he threw it off. He had like a, a, a leather type of like... Um, gown on that that was really he just had chonies on underneath you know what I'm talking about he literally took that off and so picture this um hold on um let us throw off everything that hinders us and so easily weighs us down I thought I had read that sorry let me get back to the story so he throws all this off until so the story says he's literally running 23, 25 miles and nothing but his boxer briefs and his Birkenstocks. Here's the interesting thing of this story. Can, can I just finish it? Are you ready? They said that when he gets to the town square after running, let's just say 23 miles, okay, he sees the person in the town square who's kind of giving the news, the herald is what they call them. He falls down in exhaustion and he says this, take joy, we've won the war. And he died. And subsequently every year on that day after that, they started what's called a marathon. I think, oh, give, me, give me one second, let me, let me double check something here real quick. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross of suffering. Christian, our biggest problem is you thought your Christianity was going to come without a cost, and you didn't think you were going to have to endure anything. I've got news for you that this is going to cost you more than you've ever imagined. It might cost you some friends. It might cost you some family members. It may cost you a job or two, but your faith will cost you. You are in a marathon race, not a sprint. We need to change our mindsets and we need to tell ourselves this is going to be hard and you will suffer. See, there ain't no, there ain't no fancy preaching now. People don't like that. People don't like the fact that you're going to suffer. You're going to hit you're going to hit some rock bottom and some hard times, but I got news for somebody. My rock bottom in the Lord is still better than my rock bottom in the world. That's all I got to say. Shoot, in the world I didn't have no hope. At least with Jesus, I got hope. So he says, consider it pure joy. This is an endurance. This is a marathon. You got to get rid of stuff. You got to take it off. You got to run with patience and endurance. You are in a marathon. Here's what's crazy. He goes on to say, that your path is clear, though. In other words, nothing's stopping you from running this race. He says, the Bible says, with passion and determination, for the path has already been marked out before us. Jesus has cleared the way. How many of you like the Anthony International Version? Because I'm going to give you another quote in the Anthony International Version. Are you ready? Real simple. Your future 
is God's past. Your future is God's past. In other words, what you think is going to happen in the future, God has already been there and has done that, and so he knows this is past. Let me, give you a little, let me give you a little help. God has never woken up because God has never been to sleep. Even when you don't see him, he's working. That's right. I know it may catch us by surprise, but God has never went to the Holy Spirit and said, man, I didn't see that coming. He knows what's going to happen. It's the rest of us that get caught slipping and get caught by surprise. But you can take heart today that God already knew it was coming, and he's already made provision with the vision that he's got. He will take care of you. I promise you. It's a no-hassle guarantee. He's seen it, but I know it catches us by surprise. Right? It's like I talk to parents sometimes, they're like, this is our oops, baby. Like, this caught us by surprise. Which I always go, how? <laughs> sorry, sorry. My sense of humor, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I don't know how I was surprised, but I thought we were all in the same seventh grade class. But anyway, okay. Just, um, okay, right? And it cracks me up in, in my response because I'm a pastor. I got to be nice. Bad pastor, I got to be nice. I always say something like this. Well, didn't catch God by surprise. It's my nice way of saying, like, what do you think is surprise? Right? And, and I try to tell everybody that when you serve the Lord, I'll put it to you this way. You've heard me tell this story like a hundred times, but I'll just go there right here real quick. So my wife and my daughter, oh gosh, seven years ago now. That's how you know you're getting old when you go, man, it was just a few years. Seven. I'm old. Okay. Seven years ago, they took off to Indonesia. And while they were gone, we had some stuff happen at the church. It was just crazy hectic, right? Some people were leaving, some people were mad at me, all this stuff. And I was just having a horrible week. And so my best friend, my wife's my best friend, and I talked to her about everything. And I'm like, dude, my best friend's gone. Like, this just sucks. And I remember she called me, and we're, they're totally on the other side of the world, so they're like ahead of day. And she calls me. She's all excited. She's like, we just got out of a church service. It was amazing. The Lord was moving. Oh, my gosh, people got healed. Dead people raised to life. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Praise the Lord. Awesome. She's like, no, but I'm talking like, you know, kids were on fire for God, 20,000 students out in the jungle worshiping Jesus, presence of God hit the place. And I'm like, keep going, praise the Lord. You ever just have that one friend they're trying to give you something, and you're like, great, I'm over here going through hell, and you're having the time of your life. That's great. I'm kicking it with Satan, and you're hanging out with Jesus. Life is perfect, right? She's just going on, and she could tell, like, I'm not having it. Like, you know, like, I'm, she's wanting me to be happy with her, and I'm, you know, I'm being mean, extra, and everything, and it's like, no, you don't understand. Like, people got filled with the spirit. Everybody's speaking in tongues. People are laid out. Demons are cast out. And she just keeps going. And then, I'm, then you just get quiet. You're like, <laughs> she goes, what's wrong? And I said, well, thank you for asking. <laughs> and so, so I'm like, and so I'm telling her, like, hey, it's this and it's that. And then she says something to me because she is the spiritual one. She goes, I just want you to know. Because I said something like, man, I, I'm just, I'm dreading tomorrow. And remember, it's nighttime where I'm at, but she's in the next day where she's at. And she goes, hey. Thank you. See, that's how I know it's the Lord. She goes, hey, you don't got to worry about tomorrow. God's here and it's going to be okay. And you know how you're already salty and somebody tries to be spiritual and you ain't feeling it? And you just do one of those, okay, great. And she goes, and only she can do this. She's, you know, she goes, you're not listening to me. And I'm like, yes, I, I heard you. <laughs> she goes, no. It's going to be okay. You don't need to worry about tomorrow. So I said, by this time, I'm like, man, I was just hoping you would pray for me or get it out of me or something. Cast that out of me for, for crying out loud, you know, right? She goes, no, you don't understand. I'm already in tomorrow. Did you catch this? She's already in tomorrow. I was stuck in Tuesday. She was already in Wednesday. And she said, I've already talked to the Lord. It's going to be okay. He's already in the next day. It's going to be okay. 
I know the doctor told you you got cancer today, but God is already in your tomorrow, and God's got your healing and your provision. God is going to take care of you because he's not just in today. He's in tomorrow. He's in the next week. He's in the next month. He's already seen 2022, 2023. He will look after his children. It's going to be okay. So now watch this. So you may have thought, I forgot about a verse. Go all the way back to the beginning where I should have started. But the author of Hebrews, who I believe is Paul, I've been saying it the whole time, he, he, he threw us a little curveball right here. He said, finally, brethren, since we are surrounded, remember I told you the other translation, we are encircled by such a great cloud of witnesses. But the Bible uses a word that's very specific. It says, therefore, I'm going to give you a little secret. Anytime you see the word therefore, you don't start there. you got to go back at least five verses. And if you go back up four or five verses, it says this. There were those who were sought into, who were persecuted, who were picked on for their faith. There were those who literally died in faith, never receiving the promise. The world wasn't worthy of them. All Hebrews 11 are talking about champions of this faith. And Paul goes on to say, hey, those champions, those no-name individuals who never sold out their faith, who went all in on what God's plan was, those champions right now, they are encircled around this place, and they are looking down on you, and they are looking down on me, and they are cheering us on today. So watch, 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 watch. So, um... I have a friend who I went to high school with, and, and her and her husband are in ministry. They're in ministry. They, they, they run Christian camps. And she had posted that she had just lost her dad to cancer, a very horrific cancer. Literally took him quick. She leaves her home on the East Coast to fly out to be with her dad, who's a total man of God. And she had eight days with him. And she's texting me, and she's telling me, I literally watched my father transition from this life into heaven's glory. She's watched it. And I feel so bad. Like, like that, that just sucks. Can I, can I, is that okay to say sucks? Okay, it sucks. And, and I'm like, to watch this person. And, and so I read his obituary, and he was just, he was a total man of God. Married to the same woman like 49 years or 39 years or whatever was generous to the poor, was an usher in his church, Bible studies. It's this whole thing that we would consider like a godly man. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I think like, God, you took the wrong person. Like I got about a dozen other people you could take. You know what I'm saying? Is that, is that bad? Should I say that? Should I even admit that? No, I shouldn't admit that, huh? I shouldn't. Okay, well, I admit it. I feel better about it, but I'm just telling you. Why don't you try it, okay? And, and, and so I begin to text her. I begin to text her, and I'm like, hey, I'm so sorry for your loss. And out of nowhere, I mean, I literally, I'm not smart enough, so I think it's the Holy Spirit. Out of nowhere, it hits me. Therefore, since we are encircled, such a great cloud of witnesses. And I tell her, he's not gone. He's just in the coaching, the coach's booth. And he's looking down. And he's watching you. And your kids. And he's cheering you on. And he's encouraging you. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Don't give in. Fight the good fight of faith. And they have the benefit of seeing tomorrow when you're still stuck in today. And they're saying, your blessing's around the corner. Don't give up, miha. It's right there. You just got to push through. Don't give up, mijo. It's coming. And and I started to think about all the people in my my life who are in heaven. And as hard as it gets, I just hear them saying, don't give up now. It's coming. And and they're cheering me on and they're encouraging me and they're telling me. But there's a great cloud of witnesses. and, And you don't understand, I'm hanging out with David. And I'm bragging about you, and I'm saying, hey, you thought you killed a giant, but watch my grandson. He's about to slay three of those big bad boys right there, okay? Just don't, just don't give up. 
And I'm here to tell you, believer, I, I know you thought about walking out, but don't give up. I know you thought about using again, but don't give up. I know you thought about giving up on your kid, but don't give up. That brother who's hard-headed, don't give up. That mom who's being stubborn, don't give up. Whatever it is today, there's a cloud of witnesses, and we need to honor their legacy. We need to live a life of legacy. We need to honor what they did. Let's not give up today. Let's push forward. Let's find the faith. Let's endure the hard times like good soldiers, church. But let's not give up up. Let's not give up. I just feel like today that I want to breathe a breath of hope to you and let you know that the Holy Spirit is here to empower you, to assist you. Today could be a fresh start for somebody. I don't know what tomorrow's sin has got you, but you can get rid of today. I don't know what arrow's tip is in you, but you can get rid of it today. We are a family here, and I want to see you make it. And I know today I can speak for the people in the past. Today they are saying do not give up. Just keep moving forward, and let's take on this marathon race. Amen? Stand to your feet. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for everything you're doing here and now, Lord. And I just pray that you would rise up within your people, that you would bless them and touch them, that you would be with them. In Jesus' name, we honor you. Amen.